The American Story, The Beginnings by David Barton and Tim Barton as read by Carl Hirsch. The American Story highlights some of the interesting moments and people that revealed God's providence in America. We have a fascinating history that must be remembered and passed on to future generations. Section 2, The Colonial Period. In this session, we'll be covering chapters 6, 7, and 8, and we will be discussing many other ministers that have shaped America. The Reverend Davies, 1723 to 1761, was an influential Presbyterian pastor in Virginia who also served as a lawyer and became a noted educator. He was well known both in America and Europe and his sermons were published on both continents. Some have claimed that he was the greatest pulpit orator in American history. And for decades after his death, his sermons were still widely circulated. In his last years, he was president of the College of New Jersey, now Princeton University. Much of Davies' adult life was spent in Virginia, where he preached across the state, organizing numerous churches. One of his famous sermons was for a military deployment in 1755. In it, he called the nation's attention to a very young Colonel George Washington. He pointed out the miraculous divine intervention that had just, just saved Washington's life during General Edward Braddock's devastating defeat in Pennsylvania, when Washington was serving with the British during the French and Indian War. Davies' remarkable sermon with its reference to a largely unknown George Washington, was published both in America and England, drawing attention to the young man. The influence of Davies on America was far-reaching, including through the many lives he impacted. Consider, for example, his influence on Patrick Henry. When Patrick was a young boy, his mother joined the church Davies pastored. She always took Patrick to church with her, and each Sunday as they rode home in their buggy, Mrs. Henry and Patrick would review the sermon. Hearing the great Davies preach week after week greatly influenced the development of Henry's oratorial skills. As affirmed by an early biographer, Henry's, quote, early example of eloquence was Mr. Davies and the effect of his teaching upon Henry's, after life may be plainly traced. End quote. Henry went on to become not only one of the best known figures of America, war, the American War for Independence, but certainly one of its greatest orators, being known as, quote, the voice of the revolution, end quote, and the, quote, orator of liberty, end quote. And it was a minister of of a gospel who helped him become perhaps the most effective public speaker among the founding fathers. While Henry openly acknowledged that Davies was the greatest orator he'd ever heard, Thomas Jefferson similarly called Henry the greatest orator that ever lived. Henry clearly had learned from the best. The Congregationalist minister Elisha Williams was a school teacher, Connecticut State Representative, Judge, and President of Yale. Also greatly influenced by the Reverend George Whitefield, he was not only a chaplain of the New England military forces during the French and Indian War, but also became a colonel and led troops in the field. In 1744, he wrote the Essential Rights and Liberties of Protestants, which set forth biblical principles of equality, liberty, and property. The ideas he preached were influential in shaping the thinking leading up to the War for Independence. In 1750, Congregationalist minister Jonathan Mayhew, 1720-1766, preached the sermon Concerning Unlimited Submission, reminding his listeners, and then its readers once the sermon was published, that rebellion against tyrants could be both biblical 
and just. His sermon helped form the basis of an early motto of the American Revolution. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God, which also became Thomas Jefferson's personal motto. In 1765, the British passed the Stamp Act, which levied improper taxes on the colonists. Resistance in the colonies to that measure was widespread and organized, and Benjamin Franklin was sent to the royal court in England to argue against the measure. Under unified pressure from civil and religious leaders, the following year, the Stamp Act was repealed. Mayhew, having witnessed the power of that unified stand, wrote to James Otis, mentor of John Adams, John Hancock, and other leading patriots, telling him, you have heard of the community, I'm sorry, you have heard of the communion, i.e. unity, of the churches. While I was thinking of this, the importance of a communion, unity, of the colonies appeared to me in a strong light. May you then propose to send circulars to all the rest of the colonies to help achieve unity among them in both thinking and action on key issues. May you's suggestion later became reality through what became known as the Committees of Correspondence, which dispute, distributed both educational materials and breaking news among the colonies. Mayhew's impact was substantial in other areas as well. John Adams affirmed he was one of the individuals most conspicuous, the most ardent and influential in the awakening and revival of American principles and feelings that led to our independence. So, although few pastors had the reach and influence of Whitefield, there were scores of others who, like Davies, Williams, and Mayhew, impacted their communities by shaping the people and their thinking. Sermons preached and printed during the First Great Awakening helped produce biblical thinking on numerous issues, including civil liberties, the necessity of resisting tyrannical rulers, limited government, equal rights, the evils of slavery, and much else. Sermon titles from that period affirmed the relevance of biblical truth to all areas of life. A few of the many sermons addressing political topics include, one, civil magistrates must be just ruling in the fear of God, 1747 by Charles Chauncey. Two, unlimited submission and non-resistance to the higher powers, 1750 by Jonathan Mayhew. Three, religion and patriotism, the constituents of a good soldier, 1755 by Samuel Davies. Four, the advice of Joab to the host of Israel going forth to war. 1759 by Thaddeus McCarty. 5. Good News from a Far Country, 1766 by Charles Chauncey. This was a sermon on the repeal of the Stamp Act. 6. An Oration Upon the Beauties of Liberty, 1773 by John Allen. 7. Scriptural Instructions to Civil Rulers, 1774 by Samuel Sherwood. 8. Jesus Christ the True King, 1778 by Peter Powers. This sermon, during the War for Independence, resulted in the political cry, No King but Jesus. These sermon titles illustrate that early pastors openly taught biblical principles related to government and culture. As historian Alice Baldwin documented, such sermons were indispensable in shaping America's unique view of civil and religious liberty. There is not a right asserted in the Declaration of Independence which had not been discussed by New England clergy before 1763. She further noted that the Constitution Convention and the written Constitution were the children of the pulpit. 
No wonder founding father John Adams openly rejoiced that the pulpits have thundered, affirming that the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God, and that those principles of liberty are as unalterable as human nature. The first, the first Great Awakening was foundational in preparing Americans in the biblical character and worldview necessary for a lasting independence. It also molded the young men who became our founding fathers, and a number of them became ministers, also serving as political leaders. The Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He had been a pastor in Scotland before coming to America in 1768 to assume the presidency of the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton, he helped produce and then wrote the preface for the first family Bible printed in America, which was large enough for families to gather around the table and read together. Elected to the Continental Congress, he served on more than 100 congressional, con congressional committees and is said to have had more influence on the monetary policies of the Constitution than any other individual. He also impacted American government by shaping many of those who gave us our remarkable governing documents. Nearly one-fifth of the signers of the Declaration, one-sixth of the delegates at the Constitutional Convention, and one-fifth of the members of the First Federal Congress that framed the Bill of Rights were his graduates from the College of New Jersey. Among his students were one U.S. President, one Vice President, 10 presidential cabinet members, 21 senators, 39 congressmen, 12 governors, and a Supreme Court justice, and a U.S. Attorney General. Another signer of the Declaration, who was also a minister, was Robert Treat Payne, a chaplain who later became the Attorney General of Massachusetts and a justice on the state, Massachusetts State Supreme Court. Additionally, signer Lyman Hall was an ordained congressional minister who later became governor of Georgia. And signer Francis Hopkinson was a church musician and organist who compiled and edited the first hymn book produced solely in America. Among the signers of the Constitution were also several ministers, including the Reverend Abram Baldwin, a chaplain in the War for Independence who was offered the Professor of Divinity and Theology at Yale and later founded the University of Georgia, which had a declared purpose of teaching religion to students. He also served in the first U.S. House of Representatives where he helped frame the Bill of Rights. And signer Hugh Williamson was a licensed preacher in the Presbyterian Church who served in the first U.S. Congress, where he too helped frame the Bill of Rights. Roger Sherman, the only founding father to sign the Articles of Association in 1774, the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the Articles of Confederation in 1781, and the U.S. Constitution in 1787. He also helped frame the Bill of Rights and was a lay theologian penning multiple pieces on theological issues. Numerous ministers likewise served in the first Federal Congress that framed the Bill of Rights. In addition to those just mentioned were the Reverends Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, Abiel Foster, Benjamin Conti, John Peter Muhlenberg, and Payne Wingate. In fact, the Reverend Frederick Muhlenberg was elected the first speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, where he became one of only two who signed the Bill of Rights. 
Among the scores of other ministers who made significant contributions to America's civil liberties were individuals such as Baptist pastors Isaac Backus and John Leyland, who advocated for religious freedom at both the state and national levels. Leyland also worked with noted leaders such as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison to ensure religious freedom protections in the Federal Bill of Rights. And the Reverend Manassas Cutler was an author of the Northwest Ordinance, which was adopted by the Confederation of Congress in 1787 and reauthorized by the first Federal Congress. This important piece of legislation banned slavery and protected religious liberty in the Federal territory that would eventually become multiple states. Many additional clergy could also be named, especially those who served at the state and local levels. But it is clear that the number of American clergy who held public office or directly influenced public policy in the 17th and 18th centuries was large. And clergy contributed not only on the political side, but also on the military side, where many experienced active combat, led soldiers in battle, or became officers. Although some pastors held political offices and or participated in political debates, far and away their greatest influence came from their role in the pulpit. In addition to regular Sunday morning sermons, they had other venues to educate Americans in the biblical principles of liberty. Here are seven common occasions. Number one, the election sermon. The tradition of election sermons began in 1634 and continued for generations thereafter. Many states began each year's legislative session by inviting a minister to preach a sermon on biblical principles of government and liberty before the governor and both houses of the state legislature. Of these sermons, 19th century historian John Wingate Thornton explained, the clergy were generally consulted by the civil authorities and not infrequently the suggestions from the pulpit on election days and other special occasions were enacted into laws. The statute book, The Reflection of the Age, shows this influence. The state was developed out of the church. The annual election sermon, a perpetual memorial continued down through the generations from century to century, still bears witness that our fathers ever began their civil year and its responsibilities with an appeal to heaven and recognized Christian morality as the only basis of good laws. The sermon is styled the election sermon and is printed. Every representative has a copy for himself and generally one or more for the minister or ministers of his town. Election sermons were preached before most, if not every founding father from New England as well as many founders in other parts of the country. This was the longest lasting traditional annual sermon in America, and its use continued throughout the 19th century. Number two, the weekday lecture. The community-wide weekly lecture offered regular training on applying biblical principles to pressing problems of the day. This tradition began in Boston in 1633 when Reverend John Cotton provided Thursday lectures discussing current social and political issues. The practice spread to other communities and colonies and continued for centuries. Ministers showed citizens that the Bible and its principles were relevant to everything in daily life, including economics, government, education, business, family, and faith. Number three. The Artillery Sermon. These sermons delivered to the state military on annual election of their officers addressed issues of relevance, relevance for the military. They covered topics such as what constitutes a just war, the sin of cowardice, the character and courage of a soldier, the necessity of a militia, and other relevant topics. Number four special fasting and thanksgiving sermons. These coincided with government issued calls to prayer from governors or presidents. By 1815, there had been more than 1,400 such calls to prayer. In 
And in New England, there was usually a day of fasting in the spring and a day of thanksgiving in the fall, with both of these events being accompanied by a sermon. There were also sermons on national days of prayer, such as those called by Presidents George Washington, John Adams, and James Madison. Number five, execution sermons. Ministers would often address the community before public executions for capital crimes. In these sermons, the guilty party would be called to repentance and citizens publicly warned of the consequences for criminal behavior. It was also a common practice for judges in the courtroom to deliver a spiritual challenge to defendants to make themselves right with God if they had been found guilty of a capital crime and sentenced to death. Number six, occasional sermons. These related to some significant occasion and might be preached in observance of military victories, calamities, and natural disasters or societal problems. Examples of the latter included the evils of slavery, immigration issues, the sin of dueling, or the abuse of alcohol. Anything in the news might be covered from the pulpit, including sermons on earthquakes, fires, solar eclipses, sightings of comets, and discovery of a new planet or death of a president or statesman. Anniversary historical and holiday sermons. Included in this category were century sermons preached in the year 1701, 1801, and 1901 to review significant events of the previous century from a providential viewpoint. And annual sermons reviewing significant events of the preceding year. And there were also commemorative sermons on topics such as the anniversary of Pilgrim's Landing, the construction of the Bunker Hill Monument, the 100th anniversary of a significant battle or event, and of course, annual 4th of July sermons. Political scientists have documented that an incredible 10% of all published pamphlets during the founding era were sermons and those represent only a fraction of the tens of thousands of additional unpublished sermons also preached. The impact of these sermons was substantial, as affirmed by Yale professor Harry Stout. The average weekly churchgoer in New England, and there were far more churchgoers than church members, listened to something like 7,000 sermons in a lifetime totaling somewhere around 15,000 hours of concentrated listening. 19th century author David Gregg pointed out that while the people made the laws, the churches made the people.